All right, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 13. Now, if you wonder why I do the little review at the beginning of this each week, it's because we always have a different crowd. There's always someone who wasn't there the week before or somebody new visiting for the very first time that comes in. And I like them to at least have an idea why we're at where we're at as we get into the Word of God. We're going to start out by reading 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. This is the passage that got me started thinking uh, about the message. It started out, it was going to be just simply one message dealing with the man of God here. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more other things started coming. And I'll explain that in a moment. But notice in verse 1, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the sayings of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward." The man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, the title of the message tonight is going to be A Man That Complied. As I got to thinking about the whole passage several weeks ago now, uh, and I was thinking about bringing a message just on the man of God in this passage, and I came up with kind of an unusual outline. It was a man of God, a man of God complied, a king who cried, a prophet who lied, and a man of God that died. And the more I thought about that, I thought, well, uh, why did the man of God die? What, where are the roots of this thing that would bring about the death of the man of God? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized it went back to 1 Kings chapter 11, where the man who had started outright, Solomon, as king of Israel, unfortunately, he disobeyed God. There were three things that kings were forbidden to do, according to Deuteronomy chapter 17. They were forbidden to multiply gold to themselves. They were forbidden to multiply horses to themselves. And they were forbidden to multiply wives to themselves. Now, with that, Solomon broke God's word in all three cases. As a result, the Bible says in verse 9 of 1 Kings chapter 11, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Solomon had disobeyed God. And if you go on and read the judgment that God put upon him for that, it was that the kingdom was going to be taken away from his family, all except the tribe of Judah. So that meant his son, Rehoboam, was going to lose the kingdom. And the more I thought about that, I came up with three more points. And that was wisdom denied, a king's pride, or the king's pride, and a nation's divide. Now, that's how far we've gotten so far. We're in chapter 13 now. But the beginning is wisdom denied. You find Solomon denied the wisdom that he had wrote to his own son, the commands that God had had for King Solomon. You remember early in his ministry, it is said of Solomon that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And we know that God blessed him for that. He was a servant to the people. And God blessed him especially for that. 
But in the latter part of his time as king, the Bible says that Solomon did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and departing from the living God. So he denied uh, wisdom. Instead of being a servant to the people, all we have to do is read Ecclesiastes chapter 2, find out how he spent his life as king. He was doing everything for himself. So he'd gone from being a servant to others to having others serve him with regards to everything. Then you got Rehoboam. For Rehoboam, it was all about him, his own son. He didn't learn from the Proverbs that his dad had spoken. He learned from the example his father had given. Now, that's a good point for every one of you parents, especially you men with sons. It's a very special point that you get that. They're going to follow your example a lot more than they're going to follow your words. So your example better match your words. That's just vitally important. And of course, Jeroboam, he becomes king. And right at the very beginning, we see that everything is about him. So you've got three kings, three kings that pride is seen in the way that they lived. And then, of course, the kingdoms divide. The kingdom gets divided exactly like God said. If God says something's going to be done, it's going to be done. It's going to be done for the reason God says. You don't have to beat around the bush. You don't have to try to find out what secret thing is he really saying. You don't have to interpret it. Just believe it. He means it the way that he says it. But now we get tonight to the man of God that complied. That is, he complied with the word of God in going up to Bethel in the northern kingdom and saying the things he was supposed to say and not taking any reward from the king. I'm reminded of Ecclesiastes 4.13. Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. When you get to the place where you can't be admonished, you'd be better off to be just a little child with some wisdom. At least little children do take some admonishment. Remember Proverbs 1.7 that Solomon wrote, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You do not want to be like that. So today we are at that place where I began my meditations on this passage to begin with. I want you to notice a few things. First of all, there is the introduction of the man of God. In verse 1 it says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah. Now this is a vital description of this man, a man of God. This man is called a man of God 15 times in this chapter. 15 times. We don't even know his name. Now we know prophets like Elijah and Elisha. We know about those fellows. They came on the scene and the miracles they did and everything that happened. But this man called a man of God more than Elijah, more than Elisha, and God never even gives us his name. It's not important, his name. It is important that he was a man of God. The fact that he was a man of God, please understand this, does not mean that he's perfect. There are several men who are called men of God in the scripture. And by the way, although there are people who mock that today, the term man of God, it is not just a biblical term in the Old Testament. Paul uses it twice in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11 and also in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17. When he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, notice he says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And please understand that idea of being perfect doesn't mean that he's without fault or without sin. It means he's complete. For the man of God to be complete so that he can be everything that he ought to be. That's what he's talking about when he talks about perfect. Everything that he ought to have, he has. This man is a man of God. And think about it. He's from Judah. This man of God is coming up from the southern kingdom to the northern kingdom. They haven't gone to war yet, but they almost did when the kingdom was at first divided. We see that what he's given to do is going to require time. After all, it's not going to be a short trip. He doesn't have a, he doesn't have a little car he can get in and drive on up to Bethel. That's not going to happen. He does have a donkey that's going to be with him, and we're going to see that uh, when it comes time for uh, him to die, by the way. But uh, not only is it going to take time, it's going to take energy. 
it's going to be fraught with danger. After all, he's going to a people who are not going to like him. He's standing for God, and he's going to an altar that is an altar that God himself had forbidden to be put up with an idol right there. And the Levites are not going to be the priests. It's the lowest of the people who will be the priest. And this King Jeroboam is making himself the high priest over God's people up there. Jeroboam is a rascal, and that's who he's going to preach to. He's going to deliver a message that no one there is going to like. He's going to die, but nobody there is going to kill him. God protects him when the king tries to reach out to get him. But when he disobeys God, the protection is then off. And he's going to die. But we won't be talking about that much for another two weeks, okay? So there we are. That's the introduction to the man of God. Now, it's important to notice the audience that's here because we get to verse, um, verse 3. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar saying, lay hold on him. He wanted this man taken as a prisoner. This is not a, a message that he would want to hear. Now, this is the man who built the altar. He stated the kind of worship that he wanted. Man, we got a lot of churches like that today. They state their own worship that they want, not the worship God demands. Jesus said, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This altar is in disobedience to God, and it's not the only altar that he's made. He made an altar up in Dan as well as this altar right here. So this is a king. Kings were not allowed to do the work of priests. You'll remember when King Uzziah, who was a good king in Judah, for 52 years he was a good king. But when he went into the temple of the Lord to do the work of the priest, God smote him with leprosy and the priest kicked him out of the Holy of Holies. I mean, what a shame. What a shame to end a good life with an act that never should have taken place. A king who is following Solomon Rehoboam's example. Instead of serving his people, he's simply serving himself. You remember we read last week that when he built this altar, he built it to try to protect himself. He didn't want the people going down to Jerusalem to worship at Jerusalem because he thought they're going to be liking that down in Jerusalem, then they'll rise up and kill him. Even though God said that wouldn't happen, he's only thinking of himself. He's not thinking of God. He's not thinking of the people. He's not doing anything for them. And everything he's doing is in direct disobedience to God. So you've got Jeroboam. Then you've got the people. Now, don't you kind of wonder what kind of crowd is here? What is wrong with these people? They knew about the, the uh, temple at Jerusalem. They knew about that. They knew about Solomon's temple. They knew about the rules of the Levites. There are several cities in the north that were Levitical cities. They knew about that. They knew about who would be the high priest and who, who is to be the high priest. They knew about all that, but here they are. They're looking at a calf, just like the people in Aaron's day when he made that calf and almost got all of Israel destroyed by the Lord. So we find him. He's, uh, the people are looking at this calf. They're seeing the king up there doing the work of the high priest and leading in worship, which he had no business doing. And what are they saying? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Kind of reminds you in the days of Elijah. You remember after he called fire down from heaven on Mount Carmel. And uh, then the next day, the queen has said that he's going to be put to death. So he takes off running. When God meets up with Elijah next, it's Elijah who's crying out, I, only I am left to stand for thee. And he tells Elijah, I have 7,000 people who haven't bowed their knee to Baal. The problem is they were silent. These 7,000 witnesses were 7,000 silent witnesses. They could have been an encouragement to Elijah. They could have been an encouragement to anybody else who might want to stand for God, but they wouldn't because they were silent. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed out of the hand of the enemy. Amen. We're not to be silent about our faith. 
He told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He tells us in Ephesians to reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. We have a responsibility to speak up for our God and for our Savior, for what we have in Jesus Christ. So these people, this is a big event. The king, their king is there, they're spectators. And as far as God's concerned, they're guilty. And then there's another, oh, there's another one here in the audience. That's the Lord. The Lord sees everything that's going on. Now, I'm sure some of those people there were pretty fervent. I mean, you get a religious crowd, there's always going to be some that are going to be very, very fervent about where they stand. But like Jesus told the woman at the well, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. There's true worship and there's false worship. And tr false worship is wrong. False worship is wrong. Yes, it's to be in spirit and in truth. I don't have trouble with people shouting amen. I think that's fine if it's in truth. Matter of fact, I, I, think, I think we ought to show that, man, we're, we're with the preacher on this stuff. And we're going to stand and amen here and there sure does encourage a preacher. I mean, it's like saying, sick him to a pit bull. That's just the way it is. Makes you want to keep going. Otherwise, I tell you what, when nobody's saying amen and I'm looking around and people are frowning, it just tells me to park right there. It lengthens the message. <laughs> well, you can tell who's wanting to go home real fast, aren't you? All right. But <laughs> the thing is, the Lord always sees. The Lord always sees, even when other people can't see. Even when the live streaming's turned off, the Lord sees. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, not a God far off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. Proverbs 15, 3, Solomon had written this, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil... And the good. So that's the audience. We've got the introduction to the man of God. We've got the audience. And then the message. Now, it's not a long message, but it's a very pointed message, a very sharp message. Now, you notice it says here in verse 2, And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, He doesn't say something good's going to happen to you today. He doesn't say, you can have your best life now. He starts out speaking about this false altar, and he says, O oh, altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. So notice, first of all, his authority. His authority is that this is the word of the Lord. Now, we know that God is love, but that's not all that he is. He's also holy. He is righteous. He is just. He is merciful. He is all that. He is long-suffering. Thank God for that. But he is holy. And when he judges, he judges in righteousness. Amen. You can count on the Lord doing that. You can't even understand the love of God until you understand the holiness of God. You can't understand how much he had to love you to put his son on the cross of Calvary to die for your sins unless you understand that because he's holy, you're a sinner and deserve to burn in hell for eternity. But Christ came to offer you eternal life through his death, bell, and resurrection. What a marvelous story that is. Now notice the three prophecies. He says there's going to be a boy born by the name of Josiah in the land of, David, or in the land of Judah. And this man's going to kill the priests of the high places and men's bones shall be burnt. Now that is fulfilled, by the way. And he says the altar is going to be destroyed. But turn over for a moment to 2 Kings chapter 23. Josiah is born 300 years after this man of God comes on the scene. 
That would be like, let's say, in 1724 that there was a, there was a prophecy that something would happen in June of 2024. 300 years. So he's making a prophecy. He's not making it. The Lord already made it. He's just saying what God is tell, uh, saying is going to be done. But there's going to come a man by the name of Josiah. In chapter 22 of 2 Kings, he becomes king. He's a young man. He's king for just a few years. And then he has his people cleaning up the temple. And you'll remember in the temple while they were cleaning it up because it had not been in use, he, somebody found the book of the law. Imagine going to church and having to dig back in the rubble of the church or in the basement of the church, finally finding the Bible that nobody had seen for years and years. Yeah, that wouldn't be much, much of a church, would it? I'd say that was a church that had been suffering from a famine of the word of God. They hadn't found it. They bring it to King Josiah, and they read the book of the law, which would be the book of Deuteronomy to him. It takes about four hours to read that through at reading speed. And when he heard it, he began to rend his clothes because it talked about the judgments that his people would face because they had not been walking according to God's word. And a great revival starts out. You get to chapter 23, and here's what happens. Look at verses 15 and 16. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place, which Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that's the Jeroboam, 300 years before, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place he break down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. God always fulfills, fulfills his word. There's not a prophecy from God that ends up going on without a mate. That is, there is always a fulfillment of that prophecy. Sometimes it may be a number of years, but just like this, by the way, Jesus promised he's coming back, Amen. and he is. You say, but it's been a long time. Not to him. He's going to come back at exactly the right time, and it could be tonight, and if not tonight, it could be tomorrow. We have a great God. So we see the fulfillment, Josiah sacrificing the bones of the priest of Jeroboam's day upon that altar, according to verse 16. Now, there's a future fulfillment then concerning the altar, but there's also a present proof that it's ultimately going to be fulfilled. If you look at verse, uh, at verse 3, it says, now this is a man of God. It says, and he gave a sign the same day, saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Now, look at this. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against it dried up, so they could not pull it again to him. Now, look at The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Wow. God did that. The man of God didn't do it. The man of God didn't stand on the altar. He just pronounced a judgment against it. And there it is happening right before their eyes. That's proof that there's going to be a king one day. Doesn't tell them when. But there's going to be a king one day from the line of David. His name's going to be Josiah. I mean, you can't get much more specific than all this. This man of God has been speaking the word of God. And by the way, for us to see something like this, it would take CGI. Isn't that right? We'd expect that in a CGI film. But this isn't CGI. 
This is reality. And God used it to shut the king up. Now he used that and also crippling the king. And he's going to cry out, of course, for the prayers from the man of God. Well, then we see the response. And the response, of course, on the part of the king is one you would assume would take place. He gets angry. And since he is king, he can cry out for the man of God to be taken. And that's what he does. And we read that in his hand drying up. He said, lay hold on him. And as he held that hand out, and boy, didn't he look tough. Uh, God brought that to nothing. The king was angry. Here was the danger. But God intervened. This, he could have been taken out at any time except for the fact God was protecting him here. He's been standing for God. He's been standing rightly for the Lord. Jeremiah was told when he went out to preach in Jeremiah 1.8, he said, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And then that brings us down finally to the compliance. We find the man of God complied. In other words, he not only went up to the northern kingdom, preached what he was supposed to preach, but then even though he's offered some pretty good stuff, he doesn't take it because God told him to go right home. Notice what it says here in uh, verse, oh, let's see, verse 7. And the king said unto the man of God, come home with me, now notice with me, and refresh thyself and I will give thee a reward. Now here's the king who was wanting to have him imprisoned a moment ago and now he's saying hey come come to my house i'm going to feed you i'm going to put you up here's an opportunity to get to run with the king here's an opportunity to have the people see him walking off with the king that's going to make him somebody special he's the king's preacher that's what it could look like and not only that he's going to offer me a reward now there's always going to be enticements to try to make those who are not walking with God look like they're spiritual when they're not spiritual at all. You know, that's one of the problems that I have with a lot of politicians. It, it, it's funny how it seems like the higher up that they go, they talk about the Lord, and then they do a whole bunch of stuff that disgraces the Lord. But they like to have a few preachers, of course, Somewhere have their name around behind them so that they can get, you know, the evangelical vote or whatever you call it. But uh, notice the king changes his tact here. This man of God has complied with the word of God. And notice how the man of God responds. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me, now look at this, by the word of the Lord. And then he tells him what God told him. Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way he came to Bethel. Here's an opportunity to be famous. And he doesn't take it. Here's an opportunity where a king can make him rich. He doesn't take it. Now, let's face it. If the story stopped right here, this is a special man of God. He's looking really good. He has braved danger. He has preached a message of judgment against a false worship place. He's preached a message of judgment against something that the, the king himself is doing. And he has taken a stand and decided to obey the Lord to go back into anonymity. But nobody's going to know his name. Nobody's going to know it. Isn't that sad? Not really. Who are we anyway? Some of you know, I, I like to tell the story. I just... It was one of those learning times for me as a young pastor, pastoring my first church after Bible college up in Tennessee Ridge, Tennessee. I had just resigned after three and a half years there. I was going to Manchester, Tennessee to become their pastor. I walked into my barber who was a retired Southern Baptist preacher. And uh, when I walked in, he said, oh, Brother Allison, 
He said, I understand you're leaving us. I said, where would you hear that? He said, well, some are crying and some are shouting. <laughs> well, I thought that was funny. And so I laughed, sat down in the chair. He started cutting my hair. He said, he said, listen to me, Brother Allison, let me tell you something. He said, I don't care how much you love those people or how much you think they love you. To those people, you're just another preacher. Now, when he said that, I didn't like it. I don't think I said another word to him the rest of the time there. My hair was done. I got out, said so long, left, never saw the guy again. But, you know, something about things getting, you know, just kind of digging at you. You think about those things, which is one of the reasons why I'd rather somebody leave mad than leave just ambivalent to the whole thing. If they leave mad, they're going to think about it. And if they think about it, God will get a hold of their heart. And I left mad, and I thought about it. I thought, just another preacher. Here was a guy who had asked me one time, he says, what Bible college you go to? And I said, Tennessee Temple. Oh, you're one of Lee Robertson's boys. And I said, well, yeah, I guess so. And he, he said, yeah, all you guys are alike. I said, maybe it's because we read the same book. <laughs> you know, but anyway. I got to thinking about that, and what he said was right. And today I can look back. I can go up to Tennessee Ridge. There's still some people in the church there. I mean, I've been gone from there for, for 40 years, 40-some 40 years now. And, uh, but when they start talking about their past pastors, I'm just one of the bunch. But that's the way it's supposed to be. We aren't, I didn't go there to win people to me. I went there to win people to him. I tried to get people to be faithful to him. What did John the Baptist say? When the Jews came to John the Baptist and said, you know, when you baptize, everybody's going to him. He said, he must increase, I must decrease. Our whole ministry is supposed to be about him. So what if no one remembers me? I mean, after a while, the time's coming that there'll be a different crowd of people here. Some of you will be gone. I'll be gone. They won't think about any of us. But that's the way it's supposed to be. That's not a bad thing. We're not in this to be known. We're not in it to be liked. We're here to uplift Jesus Christ. He's the one who went to the cross of Calvary. He's the one who paid our sin debt. He's the one who rose from the dead. And we're going to heaven, all of us who have taken Christ as Savior, we're going to heaven because we trust in him. We're simply sinners saved by the grace of God. So yeah, that's good. I don't have to know that guy's name. But I can't wait to see him in heaven. I just want to say attaboy. Just give him an attaboy. You didn't get so popular. You made a mistake. You messed up. God's going to tell us about that later as well. But this is the man of God who complied with the word of God. For every one of us, that ought to be our life, complying with God's word because his word is always right. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I thank you for these wonderful truths here about this man of God who did what you told him to do. He was fearless in doing it. He preached it like you told him to preach it. He was obedient. When everybody else was silent, he stood up against wrong. Now, God, I pray that our hearts and minds would be turned to our Lord Jesus who came, to, came into this world to die for our sins, was buried and rose three days later from the dead. He did the work you gave him to do so that we could have salvation in Christ. Lord, if there's one here without Jesus, I pray that tonight they'd come to the Savior. There's some Christian tonight that's just kind of floating along in their spiritual life. They're not, they're not living for you as they should. They're not focused on you at all. I pray tonight they decide that they're going to get right with you and be obedient to whatever you'd have them to do. God, you have your way in every life, I pray tonight. In Jesus' name I ask it.